Okay, today we are going to be talking about impasto paint. I will also be doing the demonstration on how to paint in uh, different uh, impasto techniques, you know, with the brush, with the palette knife, etc. at the end of this uh, lecture. So that will be on, on the same video. Okay, so um, impasto literally means dough and it refers to paint that is applied very thickly so that it has a texture that actually produces highlights and shadows okay we don't it's not flat like uh, other alla prima painting is it's very uh, three-dimensional okay so there's a difference between um, visual texture and tactile texture so tactile texture refers to the actual texture of something and everything ha that's physical um, has texture so even if we talk about an alla prima painting being very flat it still has a texture it has a flat texture probably you can still feel a little bit of bumps of the paint you can probably feel the texture of the canvas upon which it's uh, painted you it has a texture even if that texture is smooth even glass has a texture it has a smooth texture right um but when we think about texture we think about things like pine cones that are, have a lot more intense texture um Looking at this pine cone here, how do we know that it has tactile texture? Um, we can tell that it does because there are shifts between the lights and the darks that show that the thing is not um, smooth, right? If it were smooth, it would be sort of evenly um, lit across. And if, if it were round, it would have it would look more like a ball, you know what I mean? It would have a highlight in one section and then very gradually get darker towards the other side. Whereas this, it is light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. And that's how we know that it has texture, all right? Or, and, and we know what kind of texture it has without even touching it. Now we artists can create a visual texture that doesn't really exist in our paintings by including highlights and shadows and actually painting those on, right? Um, and so the neat thing about impasto paint, which this is not an example of impasto paint, is that you can have highlights and shadows that you paint with the paint, in addition to the paint actually being three-dimensional and casting its actual shadows and having actual highlights on it. So this is an example of a very flat artwork by Roy Lichtenstein. It's a, it's a um, silkscreen um, that appears to have paintbrush textures. You can see the highlights of the red and the shadows of the black um, and also with the greens and yellows. Okay. So here's a very different example that really is painted in pasta by Van Gogh. And so here you can see he applies, it's hard to tell without getting close to it, but he applies the paint very, very thickly and he also paints it in a way in which he puts colors next to each other to visually blend rather than actually blending with the brush. You can do it this way or you can blend with the brush. It's up to you. The name of the game here is to have very thick paint that casts shadows and has highlights hit it. Here is a piece by Jenny Stavel. She uses the butter knife to, <laughs> to butter knife. She uses the palette knife to spread uh, paint in a very thick manner like butter across the canvas. This is it's very hard to tell how thick this is um, on a computer screen without seeing the artwork in person. But this is an artist named Ryder. He was British, I believe, and he painted his paintings over and over and over on top. You know, he keep changing them, changing them, painting on top. And so his pieces were impasto because they had so many layers of paint all built up. And I heard a story. I don't know if this is true or if it's a legend, but I heard a story that uh, a restorer trying to update and clean one of his paintings found that the paint was still wet inside. The, um, the surface dried and acted almost like a tube of paint would, kept the wet paint inside, which would be inside the rest of the, the canvas. And so the restorer had to cut the back of the painting off, pull out the wet paint and fill it in with cotton. Here is a piece by Chris Ophelia. I showed a different piece of his in the intro. You can see that he uses a different technique. He creates these little tiny, um, almost like balls of paint. I'm not sure if he, how he does that. Maybe he uses a tube and just boop, 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 you know, creates these little um, balls of paint. But you can see this is an interesting 
thing that he's done here <clears throat> and that he's got a very flat part of the painting and then with the, the impasto part that sticks up he um, has those little balls of paint spaced enough that you can see around them and through through them but really around them to the painting behind so you can see impasto paint uh, just means thick but there's so many different ways to paint thickly Here's a piece by J.M.W. Turner. He's one of my favorite um, historical artists. He was British and he did a lot of seascapes, uh, landscapes, interiors. Um, and in this one, you see uh, it almost looks abstract because it's just that the sea is being whipped so much. Um, this is a storm. This is a boat in the distance in a storm at sea. And so he uses a palette knife and really he adds a little bit, but he also scrapes. So it's a combination of thickness and scraping um, and it has a lot of texture going on. It's really, it's really a lovely piece, I think. And um, you, this brings me to the next point. He, there's a story that he t had himself tied to a mast of a ship that was out during bad weather so he could get a real sense of what um, it's like to be a ship in a storm. <laughs> so that brings me to the next point, which is that you're going to be doing a landscape for this piece and um, bad weather is no excuse <laughs> not to not to do the piece. Although I don't want you to be you know, out in the middle of a storm, but you could look out a window, okay? So it's gonna be a landscape with deep space. So let's talk about space. Uh, two terms I want you to remember are shallow and deep space, and these are relative and they are meant to compare two different images to each other. So we could say that the Caravaggio on the left has um, relatively shallow space compared to the Ansel Adams photograph on the right. We could say that this painting is relatively deeper than the Caravaggio, but relatively shallower than the Ansel Adams. Now, what's the difference between deep space and shallow space versus foreground, middle ground, and background? These are terms, I know you've heard the foreground, middle ground, background terms before. They are also relative, but they refer to different areas of the artwork itself, I'm not comparing it to another artwork. It's used to compare areas of one particular artwork. So if we look at the Ansel Adams on the right, we could say that the foreground is the, the um, migrant workers picking the produce, and then maybe the middle ground is that truck in the plane back there, and the background is probably the uh, sky and the mountains. But there's no clear place in an artwork where the foreground and middle ground and background exactly begin and end. It's just rel relative terms that we use to describe different sections. Now, the Caravaggio on the left, we could say that the foreground is the guy's head, <laughs> maybe. maybe the middle ground is a horse and the background is the maybe the man in, behind the horse in the black. So that's, that's uh, again, it's kind of a relative term within the artwork. So that's different than describing shallow and deep space, which is to say comparing two different artworks. The one on the left is more shallow, the one on the right is more deep, okay? Now, how do we see deep space on this 2D surface? There are lots of ways. One is that uh, things that are closer to us overlap things that are further away. So you can see some of these people overlap other people, right? Some of these buildings overlap other buildings, so they're closer. Another um, is that things that are further away are a little bit fuzzier and lighter. Things that are closer are more sharp in texture. Um, they have more contrast. They're clearer, right? We, that's atmospheric perspective. And the reason we say that is that we see things as further away as being a little bit fuzzier, and lighter even if we have 2020 vision because we're seeing those things through the um, water that's in the air like in a very humid day things are more fuzzy far away and if we're in a place like a desert things that are far away are less fuzzy than they would be <laughs> elsewhere in, the, in terms of the way that we could see them but the other way that uh, we know when things are farther away is this idea of linear perspective, uh, which we'll get to in a second. 
Okay, and I just want to remind you of this term, uh, foreshortening. Foreshortening refers to any single object and the ways that the things are, um, that are, the parts of the thing that is closer to us is going to appear relatively bigger than the things further away. And so if we were looking at a man straight on, and we were to measure a foot and a hand, we would know that the foot wouldn't be that much bigger than the hands because we're seeing him from this foreshortened angle that's the case. And that's the fourth uh, way that we see things. Um, uh, we can tell that things are in space because things that are closer are bigger, further away are smaller. Okay, now I want to remind you about different types of one point, two point, and three point linear perspective um, because this could help you uh, remember how to do that from previous classes in terms of sketching out the landscape on your canvas with a very light H pencil before going in to do the painting. Okay, so one point perspective, we see this way when we're looking down a vista or if we're just looking across a field, you know, something like that, a big open space in front of us with things to the sides, okay? Um, the vanishing point uh, for the is the little fuchsia dot on the left side and it would be um, Kind of straight ahead in the middle, about one third of the way up on the um, image on the right, and we can tell this because the um, all of these lines kind of head towards that, right? So it'd be right about here, right? And when we're looking at a corner of something, then we see two point perspective. Okay, so if we were on that street, a minute that we were looking down the vista and then we just turned our to the side, so we're looking at the corner of a building, then we see things differently. We see things with two vanishing points because this thing is kind of in our way, blocking us. <laughs> so again, you can see that the vanishing points on the left are the little red dots. And um, if we were to try to figure out where the vanishing points would be, oops, here we would carry out that line, carry on this line, try to be as straight as I can, <laughs> then it would be about here, hard to draw on the computer, and then this one would be way off the screen. You can see how we could figure out where the vanishing point would be. And for three-point perspective, one, two, three would be right about here, wouldn't it? Okay. And you can see on the right side, it would be up in the sky. But uh, we see this way when we are not only looking at the side of a building or a thing, but we're also looking at it from really below looking up or really high up looking down. And that is um, because then we are seeing it um, uh, angled um, in three different kind of ways. We're looking at it being, kind of, so for the example on the left, it looks bigger at the top than the bottom, and then the um, the sides also have the, are not parallel either. So we've got three different directions and that is happening, okay? So this is all just a reminder about uh, space and you can draw your, um, uh, you can draw your landscape before you do your painting um, and any, using any method you want. You could you know, try to figure out the linear perspective if that's easier for you, or you could just kind of try to pull, look at the angles, pull them over and um, kind of imagine that the, um, the, the landscape is somewhat like a still life and use those sort of techniques that you learned in drawing one to kind of work out where everything should go and what the angles should be. Whatever's more comfortable. Um, and then you'll go in with your impasto painting, which I am going to do demonstrate now. So today I'm packing up for a trip because I'm going out into the world to do a painting of a landscape and I'm going to be using the alo I'm sorry, the uh, Im impasto method here. So let me tell you about what I'm bringing. I need something to bring on my stuff. I need something to clean my brushes and wipe down the canvas. So I've got this rag. I've got, um, you have the 
palettes where you can pull off each page. For me, I don't have one of those because I usually work in the studio on my, met on my um, glass one. And so I'm just gonna wrap this white cardboard, it's the back of uh, my pad of paper with some saran wrap, you can always adapt. Um, you're gonna bring water. You might wanna bring a good bit of water, more than one jar's worth because the impasto method is really gunky. You're gonna have to clean your brushes quite a bit. I'd recommend cleaning them with this, squeezing as much off as you can before cleaning them in your water. Um, mine, of course, is turpentine. So um, you might wanna bring a jar of water plus maybe a gallon container of water with you. Um, also your medium bags for cleaning up at the end. Um, I'm bringing, you can bring whatever brushes you wish, but I'm bringing a fan brush and you'll see why when I do get further in the demo. I want to get the whole background in thinly before I apply thicker stuff on top just to make sure there's no spots of the white canvas showing through. I'm going to do um, tiny brush strokes I've decided and so I'm going to bring two smaller brushes of different sizes and I'm going to bring um, just a little bit of a bigger one that I maybe can use for scumbling or we'll see what I need. I just wanna be prepared for all purposes. And I'm also bringing my palette knife. So this will be the first time that you probably will be using palette knives in this class. Um, I'm also bringing gloves um, because as I mentioned before, unlike your oil paint, mine is poisonous and a baggie to keep it from getting all over my book bag. Lastly, I'm bringing um, some cleaning supplies here just so wherever I sit, to do my impasto painting, I can tidy up afterwards and nobody will sit down and get paint on them. That would be terrible. So I was thinking, where should I go? Um, of course, I think about impasto, you think about the impressionists, and when you think about landscapes, something that might come to mind is Claude Monet's 30 paintings of the same cathedral. He looked out his window, uh, this church was across the street, and he painted it um, in many different types of light, early, um, bright light in the morning, um, dim light in the evening, midday sun, when it's foggy, when it's snowing, when it's warm. He painted the same thing many different ways and you can see all the different uh, varieties here in atmosphere and, and light. Um, but looking out my window, I don't see anything quite as exciting as that. So I think instead of looking out the window, I'm going to go venture out into the world. Um, I think it might be more fun to do something that's a little bit less angular. His church had all kinds of ornate kind of edges to the facade that would make sense with impasto, whereas these are really hard edge rectilinear buildings. And so I think it makes less sense to use the impasto method, which is really goopy and not precise um, with this type of um, view. So I'm going to set out. And I'm thinking about where should I go? I don't have a car and I live in the city, so I'm gonna have to go out by foot. Um, you could, you know, certainly take the bus. Um, I think I'm gonna try the back of the art museum first and we'll see if, they're, uh, if it's a good setup. You have to think about a place where you're gonna be able to use a public bathroom when you're out. Um, and you're gonna have to think of a place where you can be comfortable for the whole time. I got a whole block away before I realized that I forgot my pencil and eraser, and then obviously, of course, bring your canvas. Okay, I'm now behind the Carnegie Museum. There is a sculpture garden behind the museum. If you walk around the back of the museum, you can get here. I thought this would be a good place to um, do my landscape because um, not very many people come back here and I won't be asked too many questions. <laughs> I don't particularly like to talk to people while I'm painting. So this would be a good spot for me. Some people love to set up easels on the street and have conversations. Um, when you're painting out in public, you will probably find that people will come up and talk to you. And it's just because they're curious about what you're doing, um, but don't feel obligated to talk to them. Um, but just keep in mind that most of the time, you know, most of the time the intentions are just that they haven't met an artist before. They just want to see what you're up to. Um, but you can really politely just say that, you know, you're not interested in talking and you're busy um, or you can engage them, it's up to you. And now I need to find a spot with a good view. Okay, so I picked this spot, uh, partly because it's in the back and I won't be talked to <laughs> so much. But, um, it's a lovely spot, it's next to the waterfall. Um, but I think I want to paint out in that way because it has a cool combination of man-made um, edges. It's almost a frame, see that's pretty cool. Um, and this really edgy sculpture along with very kind of flowing um, organic shapes. 
So one issue I have is that it is just about noon and so the sun is above me here and these trees are backlit but at a certain point I believe the sun will probably keep coming this way and the shadows in the trees will change. So I might want to just kind of wait um, to get into a lot of detail to the end. I always suggest that you wait to get into detail towards the end but I also suggest that you often should go from back to front and so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to kind of do the sky and then the trees um, and then kind of move forward in space. So first things first, of course, I'm going to um, do some thumbnails and I'm going to sketch it out on my canvas. And I'm standing back a little bit because from my vantage point up close you wouldn't be able to see the whole canvas. Um, it's kind of frustrating because there's shadows on it, but let me turn around so you can see it not backlit. Ah! It's hard to get that. Um, so basically what I did here was I just sketched in the structure. So I sketched in um, the edges of the buildings, kind of basically where the trees end, but I didn't put in any of these tables or the cars or that sculpture or that sculpture or these trees because I need to do the background stuff first. I need to have a environment in which all the little objects can be placed, okay? And so uh, now I'm gonna get into putting down my first layer and I'm actually gonna do it exactly like I did for my Alla Prima. I'm going to uh, use my sand brush and my scumbling brush um, and remind you what I'm talking about. One second. Okay, fan brush and scumbling brush, anything that has kind of a flat surface for scrubbing. And I'm actually gonna start off something that's gonna end up being really thick and blobby with a really thin coat. And so I'm going to just do a coat of this thinly of this kind of uh, brownish color up here. Um, a little bit of the sky that you see there, kind of general yellowy green back here with a little darker at the bottom. I'm gonna start off very much in the same way, um, just so that way when I do put my thick paint over top, um, nothing, the actual canvas, the white of the canvas won't show through anywhere because I'm gonna be putting it down sort of blobby bits next to each other um, instead of blending it. And so little parts might show through if I don't do this first step. Okay, a couple things to note here. You can see that I'm putting out a lot more of my paint, kind of a large quantity of paint here uh, compared to the what I've done in the past because I'm going to be applying that paint thickly so I'll need more of it. Another thing, I just threw my gloves in a bag. When you go out, be sure. Um, I would recommend using gloves for this even though you don't have um, poisonous paint because um, you're out in public and you want to stay tidy. You don't want to get paint all over some kind of public space. You can see that I got some paint on myself so I'm immediately going to tidy that up. Um, not just because it's poisonous, but because I don't want to end up getting paint on the Carnegie Museum chairs and that kind of thing. So this explains why um, I said it was so important to bring cleaner and paper towels. Remember not to use the paper towels on the canvas for blending though. Use your actual rag because you don't want the fibers of the paper towels to get into your paint. Okay, just as a quick reminder about what scumbling is. Um, with scumbling, you take your flat brush, you apply some paint that's really thin, you know, not very thickly applied. It's brought down with a lot of, um, thinned out with a lot of medium and um, water in your case, and you just scrub it right into the canvas. Now, this is the first time you're working on a stretch canvas instead of a, um, a canvas board that's made out of uh, cardboard, and so there's no back to this, right? So you have to be careful not to dent it. You don't want to push so hard that you create a dent in the canvas. And you also have to be careful when you're walking with your canvas to and from where you're gonna be painting, not to accidentally dent it, okay? So I'm scrubbing, but I'm not scrubbing so hard to perforate. Now I'm also um, looking up here, I can see that there is some blue that I can see through some of the um, trees and so I'm going to have the blue come down into the tree area too a little bit even though I know there's going to be trees there because I can see it through. Okay I'll be back once I have the whole thing basically scumbled in and you remember from last week with Alla Prima that larger spaces um, like if you had a whole lot of sky for instance I don't so much in this one I could use my fan brush to get um, a lot of paint thinly applied across a broad area. 
Okay, you can see here that I'm moving from back to front. You can see I'm doing the things that are farther away first, um, kind of towards the edges and farther away. And then I'll move forward and down as I go. Um, so work on the things that are closer to me last. Now, um, I want to talk about the color I chose as my base for the foliage back here, all those trees. Um, here you can see I made a really kind of dark yellowy green. And I'm putting, putting that in because um, I'll be able to then go in with the highlights. It's a lot easier, I think, to have shadows as the base for something that's really organic like that. And then put the highlights uh, atop it um, more thickly with my impasto paint than it would be um, to start with the highlights and then try to go in and make these shapes of the shadows um, that, that are a lot less regular than the kind of overall top shapes of the highlights. Okay. Okay, I've been working for about two and a half hours on this underpainting and it took me about half an hour to get my stuff and come here. So this is a total of three hours put in at this point. And I'm drawing this scene. And like I said, I wasn't gonna put in the trees and the sculptures yet and the people. And I haven't, this is just kind of the surface upon which everything sits. And there are a couple of reasons why I did it so thinly. You can see I did like a really pretty thin ala prima, but I also didn't spend a whole lot of time on uh, making it look perfect like I did in the ala prima one because I'm gonna be painting over these with big blobs, right? And so a couple of reasons I did this. One was so I wouldn't have any um, of the white of the canvas show through if I miss a spot with my more thickly painted sections upon top. And um, let me tell you what's going on there. Actually, see right there, there's a glass building and everything's a little bit bluer in the glass, but then you can see through it to everything behind. That's what this is, okay? And it'll, it'll look, it'll make more sense once the painting is further along. So um, unfortunately you're seeing, cause I'm outside, I don't have a lot of control over the light. You're seeing shadows that exist from things like the chair over here. Um, but the other reason that I started with a base like this is just because I'm kind of an anal person and I like to have a lot of control. If you are not that way and you're more of a expressionistic painterly type of guy, guy or girl, you could go in with your um, thick, thick paint right away. I just like to have more control and the thin paint gives me that. So now um, I had been talking about the amount of time I spent on this so far and I said about three hours and as I have told you before I expect you to work about uh, six to eight hours per week, but um, you really should stop a painting when it's done and not just arbitrarily keep painting because you're trying to fill up a certain amount of time. So I found that some students' alla prima paintings end up taking a little bit less time than some of the other methods we're going to be focusing on in class. And so when the painting is right, when you got it the way you want it to look, that's when you should stop. So the six to eight hours thing, that is all about the average. So some weeks you might end up working more than that. Like some of uh, the processes are more time consuming, like the glazing method, which we'll be getting to next. Um, and some of them can tend to be a little bit less time consuming, um, like impasto sometimes for some people. It all depends because I think mine will probably take at least six hours because I do want to get a lot of details in here. Okay, so next thing to consider, do I want to have more um, impasto, you know, thick, thickly painted um, areas in the foreground to make them look more detailed and more like they are in the foreground? Or do I want to have it kind of consistently everywhere? Um, the way that, for instance, Van Gogh had thick paint everywhere. Okay. I can also think about what kind of brush strokes do I want to use my palette knife to get um, smooth, but frosting like um, paint over this thing. Or do I want to use brushes to make it more like globby, like the Impressionist did? Um, I think what I'm going to do here is um, have, I'm probably going to use mostly brushes because I want, want it to be fairly detailed even though it's going to be thick. And I think I will be using the palette knife as well. And I'm going to show you how to do that thickly um, applied palette knife work at the end, um, even though I'm not intending to do that on here but I probably will be using the palette knife to sure up edges and things like that. All right, so I'm gonna get started. I had talked about how I plan to make the shadow, put the shadow colors in here thinly first and then go ahead over top 
with the highlights and shadows, you can see that my painting looks a lot darker than what I'm actually seeing here, and that's because that was my plan. So now I'm gonna go in here and add some of the highlights and shadows that I see in that building and in the landscape back here. So I'm going to start with kind of a bigger brush and maybe I'll get into some more detailed a little bit later. I'm gonna mix yellow with black to get a, a green, but I'm gonna do mostly yellow so that I can get a nice highlight kind of green because I see a very yellowy green over there. And um, usually I would mix until I get one solid color, but what I could do is have multiple um, colors on my brush. A little bit hard to see here. There we go. So I have multiple colors on my brush because I'm gonna be applying them here um, and trying to get um, multiple colors near each other and the eye will blend them together um, to create kind of visual blending that doesn't necessarily have to exist in real life. So I could go in like this with dots or I could go in with lines, sort of like Van Gogh did. I'm trying to get very thick, luscious um, paint on here. So I'm gonna keep at that. Um, and I'm gonna be always paying attention to what I actually see up here. So you can see um, it's pretty yellow right up in there and that's what I'm going for here. But it won't be the case everywhere. Other parts of the picture plane, um, you know, let's see, very yellow here. Here it's a little bit more of a mossy color, a little yellow in it too, but not nearly as yellow as up there. That's a little bit bluer than this. So I'm gonna have to um, alter as I go. I wanna take my palette knife now. Um, let me dig it out, I'll be right back. Got my palette knife here, and I wanna create a somewhat straight edge on a building with it. So I wanna clean it on the one side See, there's no paint on it. Oh, there's some paint, but it's not thick. I want to have it just on the back. Or I could use the front, whatever I feel more comfortable with. And I want to try to make those edges that go down this building here. So, let's give it a try. This is the type of painting that I struggle with because it's so hard to get control and I'm so used to having so much control with the brush. Um, Might need to get it more on the edge. I'll go back in and pull that up too. Really, with impasto, there is no wrong way to apply paint to a surface. You could use a cake icing. Oh, want to be so close? I'll have to go back and fix that then. You could use a um, icing froster for a cake. You could use um, the back of a pencil. You could really use anything to create this. So let's fix this up, get this back out of there. You can see how incredibly messy it is. And this is why I'm so uncomfortable um, because of who I am as a painter with this method. Uh, but that's okay, it's always good to do things that you're not as good at to expand your uh, abilities. And it's oil paint, so like I said, you can always go back, correct things, pull them back out. Now I could be applying this, these thick lines with my brush too. See, I have them a little bit further apart here than back here to create that um, distance because we're closer to this corner. And then there's, they are closer together on this side of the building. Okay, and you see how this is breaking up? That means I'm not using enough medium. I'll put a little bit more medium in there. But for the most part, we are not gonna be using a lot of medium in this method because we want the paint to be thick and medium, um, makes the paint not thick. All right, so I'm gonna keep applying some more of this stuff and I'll be back in a little bit. Okay, I've gotten a little bit further along here. I'm kind of going from this corner 
forward. Um, the reason I haven't done this top part up here yet is because it is actually a lot closer to me than this stuff back here. Because you can see that it is kind of the frame through which I'm looking there, that edge. Uh, there's a bunch of teenagers being loud behind me, so hopefully you can hear. Um, so I'm gonna continue on doing the trees in the background and then I'll move forward to this middle ground stuff. Okay, at this point, I got all the things done that are in the background. I'm gonna move forward to this middle ground now. You can see that I tried to find kind of clumps of um, highlights and shadows in here, directional lines. Um, you could try to do the same lines all throughout the way that Van Gogh did. He had a bit of a style, but for me, I've got um, you know, certain marks in the sky that are different than the marks that I'm doing in the buildings, which are a little bit more, a um, little straighter. And then I have kind of clumpy highlights and shadows where the puppy trees are. And I have um, kind of winding marks where branches or um, kind of limbs and leaves kind of flowed in a particular direction. Let's get to that over here as well. Um, it's up to you how you want to do it. This is what I did so far. Now I'm going to work on this part, I think. And you can see that it's doing something really interesting right now because of the way that the light is this time of day. Um, all right, I'll be back in a bit. All right, so at this point, I've got most of my background and middle ground in here. I do not have the sculpture in yet, or either of the sculptures or these trees up front because I haven't done the foreground. Um, and the, that will overlap. So you can see I went from back forward and that made it so that when I did closer things, the edges overlap the things behind and I was able to pull those back out. You see what I mean? And then lastly, we've got this building um, that is entirely made of glass and it has these little edges. Um, and so I was able to do that very last in this middle section. I'm seeing this from a weird vantage point, but here, I'm trying to get straight up. Um, so now I'm gonna to go to the foreground and then I'll lastly put in the sculpture and then the trees. What I'm seeing in that middle ground, like there, is just sort of dappled light, some light coming through the trees in some places. Um, not right now, because suddenly it got a little bit less bright, but um, to try to do that. I'm using my fan brush just to show this idea of dappled light. And remember, this style is a lot less detailed than any other kind of painting. And down below, I see that there's lots of leaves and they're settling in these grooves and so i've got the grooves sort of in and the leaves so this has really got to change a lot from the way i have it here i'm just using the tips of my fan brush and the problem is it kind of makes a, a curved line so i'm just trying to really just get the tips but i'm going to go in with another a small brush and then pull out the darkness ar around them um, so that i know normally i would say do the darkness behind them first but uh, i'm not going to in this case because i really want to get um uh, I, just, I just think it's going to make a good, I don't know how to describe this. I think it's going to work out really well um, because the paint's going to blend together and then it's going to look more like the background where it's all blended together. Instead of being behind, it's going to look sort of um, entwined, I guess would be the way to say it. So let's see what happens now that I've got all this down. I'm not sure if this is going to work, by the way. Um, we will see. But I'm going to get this brush and I'm going to kind of go in between. This is that edge. See, there's an edge. I can pull that back out later. I can really kind of refine that better later. But it is really dark in here. Um, so I'm going to just see if I can get these paints to sort of like leave it dark in some places and in other places let the yellow kind of show through and other places have it all kind of mixed together. We'll see if that works. I'm, I'm going to use different brushes too, not just this one, because you see I'm starting to get a spot motif when I use just this one. So I'm going to just keep doing this for a long time and then um, I'll be back. I went back in and I um, am doing what I did above and I'm kind of keeping a semblance of where the um, creases are that have lots of um, leaves in them. So I'm going to put those back in as I go. And then when I'm done putting it all in, I'm thinking um, that I'll be able to tap around the areas that are more 
of the uh, yellow area that are the leaves and kind of pull that back out through the brown. got the surface again and it seemed to work pretty well over here so now I'm gonna try it again here see if we can pull out a sense of um, there being splotchy yellow things sort of in lines. I'm gonna bring in some more of it and make sure I get those uh, angles right. How did that angle look? The other one's sort of off. I guess it starts, starts here and then it goes off. Okay, so let's just start to create some leaves around there. Pull it in a little bit more here. Bigger, closer to us. It's going to be brighter, sort of. Hard to see what I'm doing when I'm holding the phone. Uh, it's not amazing, but it's a lot better than my original thing I tried. Alright, I got a line that goes there, but it's really faint. So I'm gonna be sure to make it blend out a lot up there be more distinct down here, closer to us. All right, now there's a lot of it's darker brown than I saw there before. Before it was a little bit more highlighted, and so let's make that mound it's darker in the back. It's still a bit reddish though. darker in the back and we still have this kind of pinky highlight in the front so that is good and it's got some leaves on it so that's fine all right um, I'm gonna do something similar with the fan brush for the um, edges that are slightly different color all right so here you can see I went in with my palette knife and I basically went upwards and it created this directional line um, the problem with that is when you zoom out, it doesn't look quite right now. Because if I'm looking here, I can see that there are, there is a direction to this, but it sort of goes in, it goes in that way, and, you know, various other towards the um, horizon. And so I need to go back and make these lines more like the kind of direction that I see there to get the sort of look that I want. About here is where it is straight, so keep it straight. And it starts to go this way. Okay. Now I finally get to do the tree. <laughs> All the trees and the uh, sculpture in the background. All right, so I've been working on this for about six hours and it's not my best painting not bad. Um, it's definitely very much impasto. You can see all the thickness used in here. One cool thing about waiting at the end to do the trees is that it picked up some of the color that was behind it, which actually was nice because you do see reflections of the things around in the highlights um, on objects. And so that was nice. I didn't have to put those in. They just kind of swooped up into it. Certainly I paid attention to which was the dark side, the light side, highlights that might have come in higher up. I tried using um, a fan brush because it's a different kind of texture. I'm not sure if I like it because it ended up covering up a little bit too much of what was behind. I should have slowed down a little bit. 
Um, let me zoom out so you can get a sense of what it looks like. And it does look pretty much very similar to that. Um, one thing I changed is I didn't put in the cars in the parking lot. There aren't many left um, because it would have taken a long time and not been very attractive. I also did not put in the table for people um, because it would have put me way over time as well. And so this is sort of what that view would be like uh, if nobody was here but me. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me know if you have any questions about this um, type of painting. And remember, it's okay to be messy. You're probably going to get a little bit of breakup like this because you're not using a lot of medium intentionally because you want it to be thick. Uh, the name of the game is to lay it on really thickly. So let me show you from the side of this painting. See all that gloppy paint? The name of the game with impasto is laying it on thick. Some of you guys will probably love this method. It'll come naturally, um, and some of us have a little bit more trouble with it. I almost forgot to mention one of the most important things. After I finished up with this, I completely tidied my area. That's why I brought those cleaning supplies, because I don't want any people or animals to find themselves covered in oil paint tomorrow. All right. Now I'm home and clean. Um, ultimately, after I um, came home and packed up and cleaned up, I think it took a little over seven hours. Um, now reflecting back, I'm wishing I had spent a little bit more time on the foreground. This is something I think that um, students also happens to them and it happened to me today in that I spent, um, I went from back to front. And so by the time I got to the front, I was a little bit burnt out and I was getting close to the end of my time um, that I went through to spend on this project. And so I think I rest the foreground a little bit. I probably should have had more variety of uh, yellows and the leaves, for instance, things like that. Um, it makes more sense for the foreground to have more time spent on it than the background, actually, because it's closer to us and so it should have more detail. Um, so what I would recommend for this, if you think that this could happen to you too, is maybe doing it over two days. And this would be hard for me to do where I was because these tables can be moved around all the time by people. and so. They're not stationary, and so it'd be hard to get back into the exact same vantage point. But if I were to be doing it at my window or doing it at campus, for example, um, you could probably tape, just put a little masking tape on the ground to mark where you were. And I don't think anybody would notice by the next day if you were to come back. This could be really good too for keeping you, um, keeping the, the sun from changing so much. You know, if you were to do uh, three or four hours one day, three or four hours the other next day and try to have it during the same time of the day, that could be beneficial in not having your um, shadows change on you so much. And so what I did and what you could do is just kind of roll with it and adapt and just change the colors as, as they're changing. Um, or if you want it to be like more picture perfect, you could do the other way and have it over a couple days, uh, two or three days, during the same time of day. Um, and you could look ahead at the weather channel to see if it's going to be similar weather throughout the week. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, let me know.